Give me hot dogs, hamburgers, ham dogs, hot burgers, and beer. And give me death. I, I beg you. 48 minutes of dogs barking. 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 Growl. Growl. 48 minutes of dogs barking. 48 minutes of dogs barking. So Donald Trump gets shot at. My understanding, this is my theory. Mm. I, I think this is a this was a false flag. I, I feel like that shot was so easy. I could have made that shot. <laughs> you could have made that shot. Your, your son. Your son has the posting power to he's, make that shot. He's got the Fortnite skills to he's make got, that If shot, he can yeah. hold the rifle up, if he can keep it upright, mm. I think he could dome the dog. <sighs> yeah, but well, why, yeah. my theory is that the deep state okay. took one of the mole children who okay. was rescued from below yeah. Central Park during the early days of covid and they were trying to do like some Cypress special op stuff with him, uh-huh. but his eyesight <laughs> not so good. And also, he's been living off of uh, protein power mashed with Doritos into expired Halo Three gamer fuel. Okay, okay. So really, just just not a lot going in the tank there. Originally, it was going to be a cloudy day. <laughs> <laughs> but his eyesight is just it's just not from from years of being having his kidneys hit with a uh, a hot poker to simulate his adrenal glands so the adrenal clone could be extracted so um Ellen could look good <laughs> while she's yelling at some poor PA for uh getting the wrong hospital food from Panera. <laughs> I think that's what it is cuz cuz yeah. Because okay. you look at him, yeah. There's nothing to this kid. He's the average 4chan poster, I think, is really yeah. what you know. Look like a real basement dweller, and I'm saying that as someone that looks like a real basement dweller. I think the thing that's going to haunt me for a while is um, would it have been better if it happened, or if it had, is it better that it had not happened? Yeah, yeah. Is it going to be Reagan or or Grover Cleveland? Yeah, or, or Roosevelt. Sorry, I don't know why I thought Grover Cleveland. Reagan but. or uh, Mondale. But Mondale didn't get shot at. Which is like a sad state <laughs> of affairs. Not to start this episode off on a bummer, I know, but, I know. But just... <sighs> and then Biden has COVID again. Biden has COVID. And, and the guy, that Richard Fosta or whatever. Yeah. Or David... Yeah, Richard R- R- Fusca. Fusca. The, the fake the JFK Jr., yeah. And apparently 4chaners th- th- did not know the, the QAnon conspiracy around him were like... That guy looks like a plant. Uh huh. Just like that dude's just like general way of existing, like looks suspicious. <laughs> he went to that rally thinking he was going to get some easy trim. Yeah. It's, I mean, uh, the guy that sent like the fake pipe bombs mm-hmm. that had like the Trump truck yeah. in Florida, that guy was going about it all wrong. Yeah. Because I think that, I think anyone who goes really crazy politically like that is really just trying to get their dick wet, metaphorically or literally. And I'm not going to lie, sending fake pipe bombs to, like, I don't know, Al Roker or whatever, like, that's not really going <laughs> to... It's not going to move the needle. That's not going to move the needle on the on the poontang scale, sir. Yeah, you got to aim higher. You gotta aim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just, just, what the fuck, bro? What the fuck? <laughs> you, like, had been MIA on the internet, I believe, for most of Saturday. It's ridiculous. Every time I go offline, something stupid happens. Yeah, yeah. I'm, like, I'm already, like, trying to, like, comprehend this. And you just like text me like six or seven in the evening, yeah. and I'm like, yeah, man, it's a it's a whole fucking thing, and, you know. I just fucking can't wait for steak and a blowjob day to get here. I'm just so mm-hmm. I'm so fought up. Oh, but, uh, what what a dumb country, and it seems to be getting even dumber. It's 48 minutes of dogs barking. My name's Jason. This is Brian. Politics has taken over our brains because that's just the world we live in. And boy, Brian, this week has been an interesting one. Not only was there the shooting. Uh, Biden getting COVID, but also it's been the RNC. I want to be at the RNC. I want to see Patricia McCoskey. I want to scream for the GOP. I want to sit with Dan Boncino. I want to show the American flag. Next behind the toilet in Grandma's 
the Republican <sighs> National Convention in Milwaukee. In my, in my beautiful cherished city of Milwaukee. I know. With all of these fucking jet ski store salesmen <laughs> and, and guys that like sell Blue Lives Matters flags right. on the internet. Well, one notable bright spot in the RNC... Baby dog! A baby dog. I love baby dog. If those of you who are not familiar, during a speech by Jim Justice. A West Virginia mm-hmm. governor, Jim Justice. This amazing piece of shit. Yeah. Jim Justice. Yeah. If you want a good lowdown of what kind of piece of shit Jim Justice is, the defunct podcast Scrub Stakers have a whole entire episode about him mm-hmm. that is really illuminating. But, of course, so that episode is the glory of Jim Justice's best friend in the whole wide world, an overweight bulldog <laughs> named Baby Dog. 60 pounds this year, according to uh, Michael Gold of the New York Times. Yes, uh, the crowd gathered on the second night of the Republican National Convention was promised a 60-pound bulldog. And when Governor Jim Justice of West Virginia walked on the stage without one, they began shouting the dog's name in annoyance. <laughs> <laughs> Baby dog, they chanted en masse with an energy usually reserved for former President Donald Trump or his brand new running mate, Senator J.D. Vance of Ohio. They needn't have worried. Gold continues, after a few brief sentences, Mr. Justice, who is running for Senate in his state, relented. I know a lot of you want to meet my little buddy, he said. And on cue, out came Baby Dog, a plump bulldog belly swaying as she trotted across the stage before being quickly plopped by a human helper into a cushy chair. Now, I didn't know anything about Baby Dog until I caught this uh, via the Twitter account ACYN. It's the guy who's the digital editor for the Midas Touch, a guy who basically just hangs out, watches political streams, and then puts stuff up online for us to see. And it was his 20-second clip. Here it is. And it's a a, a bit long-winded because it's Jim Justice, but then at the end, there's the pop. All I saw <laughs> was this <laughs> twenty second clip of, of Jim Justice going on like, Yeah, if Donald Trump's not elected in November, we're gonna go nuts and then it cuts to camera two, which is the big wide shot, and there's baby dog just chilling. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> I, uh, I love baby dog. I, the, I, I don't know I, I don't know if you noticed the smile on my face when you when you showed when you first showed this to me, I was like, "Baby dog, baby dog." J- Jim Justice, for all of his like, because he's like a billionaire governor, mm-hmm. uh, has lots of ties to the coal industry, just like a really like just kind of awful person, like a season three villain and justified kind of bad guy. Yeah, yeah, just like kind of a, a traditional like American political piece of shit. <laughs> but th- when the vaccines first started coming out in like two thousand one, he was like doing like these PSAs in West Virginia and online. They were like. If you ain't gonna get the vaccine for yourself, do it for baby dog. <laughs> <laughs> I it's, missed that. I didn't it's know. So, <laughs> it's it's the only endearing thing about the man. Like, yeah, you ain't gonna do it for yourself. You get the vac- get the get the old vaccine for baby dog here. And yeah, he's right. Gold continuing at the end of his speech, Mr. Justice gave the crowd what they wanted, and what only he was in a position to provide dog content. Baby dog's got a prediction for everybody here. He said. As the bulldog looked on, the prediction was the same one made by most of the speakers in Milwaukee. Republicans would win in November in a landslide, but baby dog, Mr. Justice said, was confident in his prediction. Why? Because we're worth it, he said. It was a bold assertion from an animal with no mastery of the English language, but admittedly one that revved up the crowd. And it was a hard act to follow, as Representative Jim Banks of Indiana, who had the misfortune to step on the stage next, acknowledged... I don't know about you, he said, but thank God Baby Dog is a Republican. <laughs> oh, shit, they be cooked. Yeah, Baby Dog, uh, call me up, man. Well, up. Yeah, I mean, talking about we really, I mean, we got to suss out, is, is Baby Dog a never Trump? <laughs> never Trumper? Yeah, I don't know. Well, speaking of endearing things, now you and I have talked about the Costco guys, the father and son team, who go into Costco and talk about how Costco rules and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. Well, this here posted uh, maybe two days ago on Twitter. Guy goes by the name of Judd Crud, aka at Snotworst420. I love that. The Costco guys have some competition now. It is two gentlemen in a Walgreens speaking flawless Mandarin. 
Check this out. Women should Walgreens not yet, Don Yen. Women should Walgreens not yet, Don Yen. Women should Walgreens not yet, Don Yen. Women L'Oreal Paris shine and true food shine face. Women she Wong she nine. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> we, we acknowledge our one true god, Mr. Goodbar. It's a, almost a minute long, but the last half just kind of devolves into them talking about how plentiful the water is. It's plentiful water at Walgreens. All, all the different water brands. <laughs> it is true. The water is plentiful. It really is. Walgreens does have that one advantage because I was in Chicago uh, two weeks. A lot, a lot of water there. And you need it because it's Chicago. You're walking a lot. So Costco guys, look out. Walgreens guys have the ear of the Chinese market, so you know you gotta watch out for them. Are there, are there Walgreens in mainland China? You know, I don't know, and I I begin to wonder like why was the Walgreens guys video in Mandarin? I thought it was like a like AI deep fake, like the like Nick Mullen. It's, no, uh, apparently. About the, Sucrose? What was it? Are you talking about Don Juan Jinglong? <laughs> <laughs> the, the number one glycine manufacturer? How could I forget? I'm such a dummy. <laughs> no, apparently these guys uh, learned some phonetic uh, 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 bits here. Let's see. Yeah, Biden apparently just tweeted, I'm sick. Yeah, but then followed it up with of Elon Musk trying to buy the election. It's the dumbest bait joke <sighs> thing. Uh, yeah, not great. So yes, the creator of the Walgreens guys does thank uh, Tom Gugliotta and Jack McLennan for helping complete this. Many of the comments, I love white guys speaking Chinese. White guy orders in perfect Chinese at traditional restaurants, stuns employees, but it's just Walgreens and the checkout operator is also white. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, when it's time to put the Costco guys in their fucking place. People are divided, shall we say. But speaking of perfect Mandarin, a beautiful video hit the internet right around the time that Joe Biden was uh, having a not great day with regards to debates. The Twitter user Benzos6 posted a video parody using AI to clone the voices of Donald Trump and Joe Biden to have them sing the uh, Chinese song Yi Zhang Mei. And uh, here it is in, in all of its glory. <laughs> it's presented like a karaoke video, which I think is the funniest part, complete with the falling snow in the background. And It's so good. And the subtitles. And yeah, so I first saw this with uh, Juniper can't ever die on twitter posting chinese joe biden save me save me chinese joe biden save me chinese joe biden <laughs> and so and the original post just the text was only i don't know what debates you guys saw but seemed fine to me <laughs> Which, we talked about ai music last week with the drunk driving songs this week with the chinese joe biden like shit posting as we have said multiple times is the only logical i, I think it's the only valid use of ai creatively absolutely uh, again, a politics story. Uh, Heritage Foundation, some of you may know the name because it's been bandied about recently because they were main architects behind Project 2025, a 900-page fascist playbook for how to uh, fuck shit up. Well, as part of Operation Trans Rights, where they uh, target government websites to mess with people trying to do anti-trans, anti-abortion laws... A gay furry group hacked the Heritage Foundation. You love to see it, folks. It's fucking rules. It's it's old information, but there's still some good stuff in there. Yeah. Here's one of the original posts at Kitty Discs. Furries hacked the Heritage Foundation, propelling Project 2025, which caused the executive director to reach out, and the chat logs are, are vile. Uh, Mike Cowell would like to meet you. Uh, view, uh, I would like to be left alone without my rights being threatened. Mike Howell, are you aware that you won't be able to wear a furry tiger costume when you're being pounded in the A in the federal prison I put you in next year? VO, such unprofessional language from an executive director. Would you mind if I share this? Mike Howell, please share widely. I hope the word spreads as fast as the STDs do in your degenerate furry community. <sighs> So the gay hacker, a gay furry hacker group called Sieged Sec, as in Sieged Security, claims to have hacked Heritage Foundation. Heritage Foundation says to Newsweek, no, we're not actually hacked, but 
they accessed a two-year-old outdated archive of the Daily Signal. So it's kind of up in the air whether, since you said that information was old, it yeah. may be that this was, you know. So Hacking But Legal chimes in, posted a thread analyzing, concluding that several comments on the Heritage Foundation's website originated from Asian countries. You know, why, why so many with Chinese IP addresses? One of the users in this particular comment made from an IP address originating in Kathmandu, Nepal. <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> and so, you know, it's a, it's contentious as to whether the information is A, old, or, or whatever. But it's still just a great story. I love to see hacktivists getting their due. Because I feel like that kind of fell by the wayside for a while. Yeah. I kind of feel like we kind of got burnt out. Like with a quote, quote, like white hat or hacktivist stuff, mm -hmm. particularly with like anonymous. Right. It's just a quagmire of things that we can say at least aren't bad. Also being tied to or being swirled in with things that we find to be repugnant or uh, repressive or quite frankly, stupid. It's kind of a, a slippery slope almost for as many gay furries as there are there are also nazi furs so you know yeah there's <laughs> there's apparently it's a big umbrella okay. and some of them aren't very good at posting no that they is are not. their biggest crime <laughs> <laughs> i know some brazilian furries that are, are pretty good at posting but yeah it's it's hit or miss oh boy well i guess that means it's time for crypto scam of the week brian you're listening to 48 minutes of dogs barking the podcast and now it's time for the crypto scam of the week Already? Already. Already. No. Oh, gosh. What happened now? Well, Squarespace, those of you who have been listening to podcasts and watching YouTube for the past however long, will know the name Squarespace, I'm sure. Wow. They help you build a website, and it's mm -hmm. so quick and easy. Why would you ever use WordPress or the Israeli uh, uh, indebted <laughs> platform Wix? Wix, yeah, that's the other one. So Sebastian Sinclair writing for Decrypt. In the wake of a recent DNS hijacking attack on DeFi, decentralized finance protocols, fresh insights have emerged about the potential extent and nature of the breach. So the incident involved attackers targeting DNS records hosted on Squarespace. Those records were then redirected to malicious IPs. Uh, Inferno Drainer, for example, <laughs> is one of the... Associated ones, the Infernal Drainer's wallet kit allowed cyber criminals to steal funds from unsuspecting users. It operates by prompting users to sign malicious transactions that give the attacker control over their digital assets. Once the transaction is signed, Drainer kit transfers the funds. Bing, bang, bong. Now, they usually do that through phishing websites, compromised domains. And so if they've got access to Squarespace, which is a lot of you know DNS entries... It's game over because there's a lot, you know what I mean? Like DNS entries for Web3 domains sometimes will be hosted on Wix. They'll be hosted on Squarespace. Yeah. They'll be hosted on these free or cheap hosting options. Yeah, not great. <laughs> well, for me, DNS usually stands for do not screw with it. But yeah, D <laughs> DNS I, remember, I remember that when I tried playing World of Warcraft a million years ago. <laughs> Port yeah. forwarding and DNS. Oh, yeah. It's a nightmare. So basically, there's going to be a lot of DNS changes needed to kind of fix all this. And it's bad news for anyone who uses a Squarespace or accidentally clicked a link that was a Squarespace thing because uh, they're essentially suggesting that on-chain records for domains would help with this. But as we know, the blockchain is notoriously slow. DNS... Yeah. Is supposed to help things be faster. Yeah. So, no, not good. Thankfully, it was it was Squarespace and not something larger like say a Cloudflare or one of those one of those Amazon. major providers. Yeah. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah, Amazon uh, DNS through AWS. Did you already or, say Cloudflare? I did. Yeah, mm -hmm. Cloudflare is is the one that I always have a problem with. But DNS records there that would be crippling for any Web three project. You'd be really mired in like. Okay, I gotta adjust this A record, and then you're getting into the weeds, you know. So it's yeah, very I don't even bad. Know what the fuck you're talking about, brother? Yeah, exactly. And, and so, do you think some, you know, your average D-Gen trying to, <laughs> to get their money back on? All my baby Grok is gone. <laughs> <laughs> baby Grok, my Grok in oh, you. Jesus. 
Is that a thing? I swear to God. Yeah, yeah well, that's like all of like the shit coins that spur off of a successful project or somewhat or something that's doable. Mm-hmm. It's always like, like so say like Flocky. So there was like classic Flocky. Okay. It was like Flocky 2.0, uh, Flocky baby flocky um <laughs> all this like all these variations they're all shit coins and they all like are fucking pumping dumps that barely last like two hours well another uh, crypto project that has been accused of a rug pull we're not sure if it's actually is one yet this here courtesy of web3 is going great the wonderful molly white trip.com accused of a rug pull as it shuts down its Trekkie NFTs. Are you familiar with this? Did you know about I am, this? I've never heard of this. So I had heard about this because it was June of last year when it came out, and it was a dolphin-themed NFT collection. And the idea was that you would... It was a unique staking feature called Travel to Grow, or Travel to Earn, essentially. The idea being is that you would use Trip.com to book a trip, and then when you arrived in your destination, you'd do some sort of blockchain mishigas. I don't know exactly what it was, but it was like, okay, the distance you traveled is applied as a, it, I don't even remember the mechanics of it, but I remember being, okay, well, at least it's interesting and novel. Like you're trying something. Yeah. Like something's being tried. Of course, this was not sustainable. No, of course not. Here's the, the, Trip.com promised that its discount coupon functionality would remain. So yes, if you traveled, you get discount coupons and whatnot. One person in response to the shutdown can't believe at Trip, a multi-billion dollar company, is also a rugged project. And uh, Trekkie writing here. With Yeah, we regret to announce the official termination. The website's going to be retained. Discount and coupons will be retained. Users can claim coupons through July of next year, July 1st. All Phase 2 features terminated. Oh, yeah, here is future possibilities. Considering the unpredictable changes in the futures, we do not rule out the possibility of restarting the Trekkie project at some point in the future. If the Trekkie team launches new projects, additional benefits may be granted to NFT holders. Yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. Probably not. Probably not. Um, But it even goes to show that when, like, a company actually has like at least a idea that seems like it can be executed on. Yeah. Like it's still not viable. No, because it's the scaling. It doesn't scale. No. I think that's a major problem with these types of things. So, and I mean, what's even like the fucking floor, uh, Trekkie. Wow. <laughs> Let's see here. Floor price point zero zero five one ETH. I think that's not even 10 bucks. Uh huh. I don't get NFT people. There's, I see some of these guys on Twitter. They're like, oh, you know, I'm sweeping the fucking floor on <laughs> such and such project. Right. And I think the only guys that actually like made out doing that were the guys that bought like pudgy penguins and stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, something really early. Well, I mean, pudgy penguins kind of sat around, did nothing for what feels like a couple of years. Hmm. And then they, you know, you can go to a fucking, apparently go like Walmart and buy pudgy penguin stuffies. <sighs> and shit like that, and there's like product and all that. I, we, I think we talked about this a couple months ago. Yeah, I think like Pudgy Penguins is like I think the only OG NFT project from like 2021 that's actually still like doing something. I mean, Bored Apes are still around. Yeah, but are the, are, I mean, they sold like their Neverhood lands that like, never went anywhere, and then they had that one mint where. <laughs> What was it like four hundred dollars to just like approve a transaction? I don't even think it was like the transaction itself. Oh jeez. There's so much crypto stuff that just goes it blows right over me like a breeze. I don't I didn't I just, stick like, around. I had like a, a thought the other day of just how much money has just been shat down the leg with not just NFTs, but with the, with bored apes. Specifically then that ecosystem. Yeah. Like Yeah. It's it's gotta be a huge amount. I'm sure it's considerable. Gosh, the people that gave us Dookie Dash turned out they weren't good at <laughs> sustainable projects. A turd-themed video game couldn't turn a profit? Are you kidding me with this? And they had problems with hackers? Yeah, yeah. Well, anything that's popular is going to do that, though. I mean, look at you know, Team Fortress, like a Fortnite, Destiny. That was the, uh, the other joke I had for the Trump attempted assassination was that if I were going to do something like that, my manifesto would be something like uh, Valve fix TFT2. Yeah. Rid of the bots. 
Bungie fixed Destiny 2. I think it'd probably be easier to fix Team Fortress 2. Fair enough. That's fair. I think one of my monkey paw wishes would be uh, make me care about Destiny 2 again. Uh, easier said than done. Yeah, I don't know. Well, brother, I'm going to tell you something. Huh. It's relevant to the topic. A couple of years ago, I was in Chicago and I was seeing a show at the Metro. I think it was like Sue Jeff Stevens or phoenix or some bullshit and i was using the bathroom i was, I was uh urinating at the at the urinal as one does and uh, yeah and i thought i heard someone behind me i looked around i didn't see anyone and uh, i'm about to finish up and all of a sudden someone came comes up behind me and they they put their hand over my mouth and with the other hand they start going at my belt okay and they undo my belt okay and they get at my dick uh-huh and I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm struggling. I'm freaking the fuck out. Yeah. He's going. He's going for my dick. And he's squeezing my balls like he's trying to pop a cherry tomato. Jesus. He starts jacking me off. I mean, it's like sandpaper. It hurts so much. Like I can yeah. just like feel my like my toenails like digging into the insoles of my shoes. Oof. And this felt like it went on forever. When it was over, um, up against the wall, I'm just like exasperated. I'm freaking the fuck out. And I look over, and it was Bill Murray. <laughs> and you know what he said to me? He said, no one will ever believe you. <laughs> oh, this has happened to you, too. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and I was like, I was thinking, like, I bet the guys on the chive would believe me. <laughs> yeah, they probably would. <laughs> so... <laughs> Oh, boy. Uh, so, the chive, if you haven't figured it out, was our main topic tonight. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> you got me. You got me real good for a minute there. And then, like, okay, this is a joke. This is a joke. What's the punchline? What's, I, couldn't, I couldn't figure out what the punchline was going to be. Yeah, there was. So, well, maybe, maybe I was just top trauma drunk. Don't they? Right. Yeah, it's like, oh, um, okay, let me, you know, let's, let's get you some help. But uh, <clears throat> the chive... <laughs> Really hard to move on from that. All right, so the yeah, ch- I didn't mean to the throw chi- this right up against the-, the the chive. The chive started in 2008 by two brothers, John and Leo Resig. Uh, subtitled, probably the best site in the world. Mm. A claim that is dubious at best. So these two brothers, two brothers, just two brothers, just two brothers, and so they started a this website, but they have been kind of entrepreneurs for a while. They both hail from Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is an interesting place to kind of start up. But so co-founding the Chive Media Group, the parent company of the Chive, but also the Berry, the Chivery and Chive Rare Coins.com. It's listed <laughs> as I know, it's listed as a photo blog and entertainment website, but it is mostly known as a men's entertainment website i've heard it referred to as what if axe by spray were a website yes or what if maxim never put out a magazine and was a website only yeah, that a, kind of a lad mag yes yeah, Fritz would say stuff or whatever it is you know whatever your lad mag of choice is. but yes that is essentially the vibe and kind of the thing that they're going for uh, max reed coined a term called the zinternet have you <laughs> The fuck? This phrase. He also referred to it as like the bar stool internet. Okay. Uh, the Zinternet. Uh, the Hawk Tui and the Zinternet. Yeah. So this was a couple weeks ago. Max Reed's uh, Substack Read Max. His idea is, you know, because he, he's talking about Hawk Tui and everybody knows what that is because we talked about it a couple weeks ago. It's not precisely a mystery why a video of a cute girl making raunchy jokes would attract attention online. But the broad success is less about its own quality than about the increasing size and cultural power of something I'm going to call the Zinternet. Now, he claims it was the past 10 years or so, but I think it was longer than that. A broad community of fratty, horndog, boorishly provocative 20 and sometimes embarrassingly 30-somethings, mostly but by no means entirely male, has emerged to form a newly prominent online subculture. This network is adjacent to the sports internet of 40-something dads and the hustle internet of Miami crypto bullshit and the reactionary internet of trad influencers, but is its own distinct community 
with its own distinct cultural reference. College sports, gambling, light beer, Zin, Zin nicotine pouches, and influential personalities amongst them Dave Portnoy, Pat McAfee, Antonio Brown, and the podcast Call Her Daddy. So using that broad framework that Max Reed had come up with for the Zinternet, I think that kind of applies, maybe retroactively, because again, this was 2008, a couple of years mm -hmm. before what Max Reed would call the Zinternet became a thing. But I mean, it's frankly the same stuff. Uh, <laughs> it's very broified. Reading here about the Chive from the Chive's website, the Chive is home to the best funny, viral, and interesting photos from around the world. Yeah, I yeah. think the best way to describe the Chive hmm. is like Ebom's world for dudes that are going to die from skin cancer. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, what's really funny is that one of the guys, John Resig, did have a bit part in the HBO vampire drama what True the Blood. Fuck? Yes. That, yes. Is, that is so fucking weird. <laughs> Actually, he was on it for a couple seasons. He was Deputy Kevin. A Deputy Kevin it's Ellis so on fucking True weird. Blood. I mean, good for him for like, you know, you know, having a broad, you know, C V, but like Huh? <laughs> in John's bio on the chive, John thinks he's Peter Pan and has no plans to leave an emotional state exceeding that of a college freshman ever. All right. What about the women of the chive, though, Brian? Oh, the women of the chive? Are they smoke shows, sir? Apparently. Uh, Emily, a.k.a. Emrez, which means that she's married to one of the brothers. Yeah. Um, yeah, here it is. Uh, over a couple of pints at Emmett's Pub, John and Leo convinced her, she said yes immediately, to quit her job and start the site in November of '09. Since then, she has thrown out all of her calendars and has stopped setting her alarm. She has no idea what day it is now. And then Megan... I'm guessing the younger sister. Megan is the youngest sibling of the Resig clan. You might be asking yourself, what does super hybrid mean? She takes on all the genetic traits that make Emily, Leo, and John baller status, if you will. So I'm guessing Emily is another sister. Emily Rez. M. Rez. So. Okay. Weird. Yeah. A lot going on here. Oh, family These affair. Photos, like, I'm almost going to say, not to be too judgmental, but going by the these two ladies, their photos here on the website, these feel like they were taken in, like, probably 2009 or 2010. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the beach, somebody's wedding. Yeah, like, uh, Megan's haircut, those swoopy bangs. Very, very, yeah. Feels very, oh, yeah, my my boyfriend has a DJ Naya place that has dollar TVRs. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So, lest you think uh, the Chive and the Chive family of websites is only for the men, the ladies got their own site called theberry.com. Not really sure what that's about. But <laughs> what makes the Chive interesting, at least from a internet historical perspective for me, is not so much the barrage of beer-soaked bro memes, but that they were very famous for about three years for doing elaborate hoaxes. Some oh, of them wow. not even all that elaborate, honestly. When we do stuff like this, when we talk about these kind of like more God, historical websites, yeah, it is hard to imagine that people fell for this shit. Right, that you could get away with something so simple. Yeah, some something so blatantly transparent. Because if you look at it now, so <laughs> one of their first ones was the teen texting disaster. Hoax. Now, this one they explain on their own website. The article reads, Last week, the Chive published a story about a young lady named Lizzie Frisinger on a class trip who accidentally sent a text message to her father after losing her virginity. The story exploded onto the blogosphere. The Inquisitor, BuzzFeed, and Huffington Post were just a few named sites that picked up the story, but it didn't stop there. ABC's The View devoted an entire segment to the story. And this morning, the Today Show follows suit. Both national outlets reporting the incident as true. And just minutes ago on the East Coast, Jay Leno reported the story on The Tonight Show. How did we pull off this hoax? They say, well, they found a photo. Find a camera. Okay, they shot some photos there. Find a phone. They faked a contact named Dad. It was probably one of the brothers. OMG, writes the fake Lizzie. Just had first time on beach. Great, GR8. Wish you were here! Exclamation point. And the father responding, I'm assuming this was intended for someone else, Lizzie. Class trip is over. Tomorrow, 7 a.m., Delta number, and then they blacked it out. 
use my credit card for taxi. Three steps, three photos. They had a huge uproar about this. I remember this. Yes. And it was fake. Just as fake as text from Bennett. Hey! But uh, my favorite is the tag they added on this. And there you have it, a viral meme in three easy steps. You don't have to worry about us pulling this again. The Chive is a photo blog, not a news source. Well, they did it again, folks. Yes, they did it again. So the teenage texting disaster happened in 2008. Now, the year before, they had done one involving Donald Trump. And that one... I I can't ever imagine Donald Trump being as uh, generous. Yes. (laughs) David Sarno for the Los Angeles Times. Did you hear that Donald Trump recently left some Santa Monica waiter a $10,000 tip? Oh, yeah? Where did you hear it from? Because if it was anywhere in the giant asteroid belt that is the celebrity blogosphere, or even at foxnews.com, defamer, e-online, or the Huffington Post, you might want to check your sources. Everything about that story was false, such as the plausible-looking receipt showing the monster tip in Trump's signature, the existence of Billy D., a putative waiter at Santa Monica's Buffalo Club, as well as the fact that Trump had been in Los Angeles this week at all. Trump told the New York Post, page six, he wasn't in California that day, and that, quote, this was done by the stupid restaurant to get publicity. So, yes. (laughs) Folks, I've been to the Buffalo Club. I wouldn't tip there if they had a gun to my head. (laughs) Now, uh, what's even funnier... Terrible people. What's even funnier is that this L.A. Times piece claims that the the actual hoax was perpetrated by DRober.com. DRober, run by... John Resig. That's right. DRober's John Resig spilled the beans and laughingly marveled at the hoax's success. How many people get on the front page of Fox News with a story that doesn't contain one single ounce of truth, he wondered in amazement. Now, in the intervening years, we realize that's not as hard as as it makes it sound. But uh, (laughs) Ariana Huffington, Huffington Post, even got in on the action. Uh, Ariana Huffington explained it was an unavoidable anti-perk of the Internet news flow. The Huffington Post fully vets its own original reporting, she explained in an email, but this kind of third-party content isn't easy to verify. Yes, things move fast on the internet, she wrote. The downside of this, occasionally an inaccurate story can get a lot of quick pickup. Upside, the internet corrects itself very quickly. And let's remember, this wasn't a phony story about aluminum tubes put on the front page of the New York Times. This was a fun, positive story. Oh yes, aluminum tubes, the Weapons of Mass Destruction <sighs> stories. This was 2007. So yeah. oh boy, yeah, boy, we can have we can have a laugh, mm-hmm. folks, folks. Can't we laugh? I think can, we have. Can to. we laugh, Jason? We have to. We have to because there's no other option. Uh, the Chive continued their reign of terror well on into uh, the uh, late tw- uh, sorry uh, 2010. Arguably their most famous hoax, the one that people still remember to this day. This one I. Fucking hated. You hated it from Tell the me second more. I saw it. I was like, even if this is real, it's fucking stupid. Yes. The basics of the story is that the chive put out the series of photographs. Girl quits her job on dry erase board. Emails entire office. This format about the dry erase board and like telling the whole office has been mimicked on TikTok now. You'll, instead of the dry erase Weird. board, it's just like text. Oh, uh, and then they're pointing at it, you know, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's been done. It's been redone, basically. Yeah, because there was, like, stuff that was being said in the hoax that, like, didn't make any sense that people picked up on really quick. Yeah. I don't, again, I I haven't really thought about this too much in the last couple of years. I have more important things to think about, like, um, why Fallout 4 is a bad game. (laughs) Oh, yeah, Hopa. Hot piece of ass or whatever? Yes, that was the big, the, the, an acronym that came out of that. According to the Chive, oh, here we go. I quit. I've learned a lot these past two years, and I'm going to miss all of you except one. I'm looking at you, Spencer. Being your assistant's been a special hell. I put up with your temper and your bad breath because I wanted to be a broker. On Friday, I transferred you a call. I was about to hang up when I heard you call me a Hopa. Hopa? Hot piece of ass. Is that really all you thought of me? Did you ever wonder why everybody in the office called the trash a garbage dispenser? Office morale is down since you installed the little office snitch so you could monitor how we spend our time online, so I wondered. 
How does Spencer spend his time online? You gave me the codes, after all. Four hours a week on Scott Trade. 5.3 hours a week on TechCrunch. And drumroll, 19.7 hours a week playing Farmville. Wow. So this Hopa's moving on, and she's done a, a outfit change now. Yeah. Oh, she took her, her glasses off. Uh-huh. And now she's hot. See, that's the... <laughs> she has value now in our society. <laughs> Although I don't have another job, something tells me I'll be just fine. That got passed around just... It was everywhere. You couldn't avoid it. It was months, months of this. That was a, that was a lie. That was Elise Porterfield, the actress... It was suggested by some that 2010 saw a series of online quitting posts. There was the guy who quit uh, JetBlue. Took a couple of Heinekens and slid out the escape. <laughs> That's right. He pulled the slide at the door. Yeah, that actually kind of fucking rules. Yeah, and so they kind of took that idea and were like, oh, well, what if we did it through a series of images where she writes on a whiteboard? Which is fine, I guess. But yeah, it was all bullshit. It was all a hoax. It only took him a day to cop to it, which is really funny. Chicago business blog from a gentleman named Robert Lorzel. A day later, the chive revealed it had all been a hoax. Jenny was actress Elise Porterfield. Communicating again by dry erase board, she said, I've had a blast and more than anything, I hope you've all been entertained. Leo Resig is quoted as saying, people love job quitting stories. Everyone's had a job they don't like. They've always wanted to peace out in a dramatic faction. So that's exactly what this girl, this actress, did in this case. Mr. Resig credits his brother John, who works out of California for concocting Jenny's story. Yeah, so that <laughs> and it says it wasn't the first time. And then they recount the Donald Trump tip story. Leo Resig is, is also quoted as saying, We've cried wolf a few times, but we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We're not too concerned about journalistic integrity, People will keep coming back because we're not really reporting the news. Anyone who thinks the chive is reporting the news, raise your hands because you're getting fucking fired from this podcast. You're getting pushed into the old mine. <laughs> and so what does the chive look like today? Uh, it's fine. It's whatever. Here's, uh, here's the chive. Hot fails are sweet. Here's a uh, lady somehow doing failing. This is like BuzzFeed. For guys that own like a shirt that says like you know, cool story, babe. Now make me a sandwich. Mm -hmm. And 15 restaurant employees reveal which foods to avoid at all costs, and it's Adam Sandler holding a Subway sandwich. So, all right, you got me there. Hump day. Yeah, okay. All right. It's, uh, keep cats and chonk on. Okay, that was the one thing actually. When the internet meme of keep calm and carry on, which was kind of discovered in an old British. Something or other, and it was supposed to be a World War II kind of keep calm and carry on. That was there, but it, it never really made a splash in England. And so, for some reason, it was unearthed in the mid 2000s and became a thing. Well, people who are big fans of the chive like to say, keep calm and chive on, brother. Fuck me. <laughs> I think a lot of like my weird anger on the internet in like the early 2010s came from stuff like this like this was like the normie culture yes on the internet like twitter was like the last refuge of people like just being weird on the internet for just the sake of being weird and interesting and i felt like these people came in with their puka shell necklaces <laughs> and their dogs and little pink purses and their bad highlights and they're just like uh whoa uh, she queer, John. That's fucking <laughs> sick, bro. It's crazy, man. Oh, it's not real. What? No, no way, bro. No, bro. No way, ham slice. I think Barack Obama was a born in America. You know, like, there's, like, <laughs> there, I think there's a direct line to like the chive. <laughs> yeah, and like thinking like raw milk is good for you. I let's see careers. Look at let's, let's yeah. See. Let's see who they're hiring for. Chive. I want to get a job at the chive. Okay. Not I mean, they don't Page have not job. found. Okay, well, there you go. They got a lot of broken links, I've noticed. Oh, cool. I'm your shirt. Side quest for tacos. Oh, wow. I'm so fucking wacky. Everyone, everyone fucking loves me at yeah. Ameritrade. Oh, that, perfect. There's a hawk to a t-shirt. Get your riz off my lawn. I got that dog in me. Hotter than a hoochie coochie. 
Uh, I heart planting my lips based around meat-based meals. Um, Houston, I have so many problems. Get your own tots. Tina, you fat lard. Wow, Napoleon Dynamite references on a $35 t-shirt. Uh, uh, Napoleon Dynamite, which turns uh, 20 years old right. this summer. <laughs> yeah. I actually got to see an advanced screen of that movie and still have uh, a bunch of swag from it. I have a couple sticker sheets. What did you think of of Napoleon Dynamite at I the time? Was really fucking funny. I, I remember getting like the Napoleon Dynamite branded chapstick. Perfect. And the, my yes. swag bag. It was... I thought, until I realized it was a bunch of weird fucking Mormons, I thought it was really funny and creative and weird. Yeah. I've always thought like, that. Oh, it's this weird Mormon shit. Okay, this is like half funny now. Yeah, it but, definitely uh, changed the game know, a little bit. Um, there's, go away, Napoleon. I'm talking to hot babes online. <laughs> like, yeah. There's, I mean, your mom goes to college. There's some stuff. Your mom goes to college. <laughs> you know, uh, give me those tots. Yeah. I guess I bet you I could throw this football over these mountains. I guess you could say it's getting pretty. We've been talking on the internet, so I guess it's going to say it's pretty serious. Uh, yeah, but there's there's a lot of stuff to like about that movie. So one thing that struck me when thinking about the chive is that it felt like, unlike any number of the sites we've talked about in past or even recently, yeah, it never really created memes of its own, with the exception of that really dumb "keep calm and chive on" nonsense. Yeah, it's um kind of like an internet wasteland. It's kind of it feels like uh, where things go to die. Yeah, it's just dumps of photos, and people who are you know really obsessed with the site call themselves chivers, which is just painful. Yeah, um, it's painful. The guys podcast with uh, Brian, formerly of Street Fight Radio. Oh, they recently did an episode on chivers. Oh no! I'll say like a month or so ago. No. I have not listened to it. Yeah, it seems like the response is like it is one of the more grating episodes they've done. Not necessarily by uh, what Brian and his, and CJ, his co-host, have done. Right. Uh, I'm feeling a little. I feel like I could like fight a guy like right now. <laughs> you got that Cayman Jack uh, strawberry margarita. Yeah, I, I picked up a, a tall boy. <laughs> I I had to stop at the grocery store to grab something for dinner. I was like, "Fuck, all right." I was looking at the tall boys, and I was thinking, like, you know, if we didn't have shit to do tomorrow, mm. if I didn't have shit to do tomorrow, and I knew if you didn't have shit to do tomorrow, I was like, I should probably get the Fort Loco. Ooh, that's that's how you know it's a gnarly like part time living is you can just get Four Loco at the at the grocery store. Yeah, I mean the grocery stores around here also carry it. So you know. Oh, I have of... I just I haven't paid attention to the Tall Boy selections <laughs> lately. Not much of a Tall Boy drinker now in my late thirties. Yeah, ten years ago is a little bit of a different story. But I was like, you know what? I saw about getting like a Twisted Tea because that feels like kind of a, mm. a chiver type <laughs> drink. I don't know. The Cayman Jack strawberry margarita definitely got me in the right mindset for the for the yeah. chive. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just. Uh, these are the guys that are killing these by the dozens and going like, "Yeah, broski, let's go floating." You know, yeah, let's, go, let's go. Let's go. Good to the Ozarks, brother. Yeah, uh, let's go to uh, par- Party Cove, bro. Uh huh. See some, see some trim, bro. That's exactly right. So after 2010, they really kind of eased up on the whole internet hoaxes thing. They still kept the chive running. Again, they've got the sister site, the Berry, which is supposed to be for the ladies. Ladies, rest assured. You have uh, your own uh, fucking website. Now, <laughs> The Verge, four years ago, did a piece on them called <laughs> Boob Job, How the Chive Built an Empire Out of bro bait. Uh And then the subhead, the website defined frat culture in 2010, but can it survive a decade later? This written by Zoe Schiffer. I think, Zoe, that you underestimate exactly how stupid people are. She opens the article with, Boobs are back. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. You gotta love it. They probably never COVID left. COVID couldn't kill the titty. I'm telling you. At the Chive, a website dedicated to humor, hotness, and humanity, they're everywhere. Bouncing in slideshows on the company's homepage, spilling out of models, push up bras. The Chive asks you to reconsider what you know about cultural progress. Here, racy photos are always empowering, lewd comments are downright chivalrous. Chivers, men who read the chive, are quick to emphasize that the website is about more than hot women. It's a community of people who prioritize friendship and charity above all else, except perhaps having a good time. Chivers are veterans, first responders, Midwesterners. They might be Republicans, but you can't say for sure because the chive never talks about politics. 
The apolitical, tit-centric aesthetic makes looking at the chive feel like time traveling to the early 2000s, pre-cancel culture, pre-Me Too, pre-President Trump. Women, called chivettes, submit seductive photos of themselves in the hopes of being featured in a recurring slideshow titled FLBP Future Lower Back Problems. I, um, (laughs) a very, very old ex of mine... We're talking like almost twenty years ago. Yeah, we still keep in touch sporadically. Mm -hmm. And I remember her telling me, like in the late two thousands, like, yeah, my boyfriend convinced me I should like submit photos to the chive, and I was like, that guy is a low value male. Yeah, (laughs) oh, uh, that's cool. I hope you're not like hoping to get married to this guy. I would think more of this man if he suggested you sent photos. To Howard Stern or Penthouse. Or even like the local horn dog and the butt fucker radio show yeah. Morning Zoo. At least you could get like a, a fucking Sir mattress out of it. <laughs> or a gift card to yeah. Hooters or whatever. So this was most illustrative because this again, this was 2020. The Chive headquarters in Austin, Texas has a decorating scheme somewhere between Playboy Mansion and Southern Frat House. Copper bar, bare skin rug, decorative AK-47s. <laughs> Nearly 100 young workers busily type at computers. It looks like a typical tech company, save for the images of lube and semi-naked women on people's screens. The office is most well-known for having a wooden slide that looks like it could break a tailbone sloping from the second floor to the first. A camera position at the bottom is ready to capture any major wipeouts. April Fool's Day is a big deal for the chive. Last year, again, 2019, it pretended to launch... Firefest 2. Uh, yeah. The year before, it became a North Korean news station. People were pissed, John says. This year, it's either going to pretend it's been bought out by BuzzFeed, say that rogue AI has taken over the site and is trying to masquerade as a human, or go with a medieval theme. Okay. All right. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna <laughs> to say something here. Despite all of my hostilities, yeah. I bet... If you're really in the shit like this, hmm. this doesn't sound like the worst place to work. No, like it sounds it actually, like a baller. Yeah. It actually kind of sounds like this kind of sounds like it would be interesting. Yeah. They did say publicly and to their employees in 2016, uh, Cousin Bob. Again, this is all in the family. The Resig family is all over this website. It's kind it, of wild. It, it, so Cousin Bob sent out an email to the editorial staff reminding them, quote, keep politics out of content. John responded with his own rallying cry, quote, We're in a great position this morning because we doubled down on the average American over the past years. I could even say middle America and our military. We won by not being snarky or talking down to our audience. Now it's time to claim our prize because it f- turns out it's finally okay to be an average American again. Ugh. Ugh. I don't like that one. That feels bad. Yeah, I don't like that either. But I mean, what do you expect? They started their, you know, their endeavors by doing a a Donald Trump hoax that cast him in a positive light. So you gotta wonder. Oh, boy. I don't have a lot of faith in Donald Trump being like a crazy tipper. I would probably give him the benefit of the doubt that he's probably tipped a couple hundred bucks. Sure. On, you know, a couple leave a couple hundo. The bare minimum, though, on like a two thousand dollar bill, you know, he's tipping like ten percent sure, sure. or whatever. Yeah. But I have always heard stories about like Howard Stern and other celebrities that like always leaving like really generous tips, not like ten thousand dollars, but like oh that make that made that person's month. So I mentioned briefly earlier that there is a charitable component to the chive. Now this is the only thing that I think makes the chive kind of still worth having around, because they did launch a charity arm in twenty twelve with a focus on veterans, first responders, and people with rare medical conditions. So it's essentially a a rotating series of charities. It says here, if the Chive heard about a family who needed an accessible vehicle to transport their kid with special needs, Chive Charities fundraise to get the car. John here quoted as, we're like the Oprah Winfrey of ADA accessible vehicles. Not the comparison you want to go for, but all right. (sighs) The Chive Charities has continued. Uh, I think the most recent one was this gentleman named Richard G., the wheelchair crowd surfer you know and love, it says. One of the longest-standing Chive Nation members, Roland Rick. Rick lived in Vegas. 
He met two of his good friends who were both Chivers. Okay. And Chive Charities uh, fell in love with this guy. They, they sent him out to uh, do some crazy shit in Chicago. Uh, Richard turned to the Chicago Chivers on advice whether he might be able to get some help from Chive Charities. And so he applied. Thanks to the incredible support from our donors and with the help of his mom, we were able to provide a grant of $15,475 to help Richard redo his shower, add stabilization bars and a bench, and widen the doorways in his home to accommodate his wheelchair. Not a bad thing, if you really think about it. Yeah, if you're getting plastered with a purpose, like I can't really hate too hard on that. It's just there's a, a general um, grindiness. Yeah to kind of digesting the chive like it's it's definitely horny in a way that like it's kind of a outdated yeah it really the chive really does feel like it's built for grown men that would get really excited if they found like a moldy playboy like in the <laughs> woods woods porn i'm sure a good number of chivers have their own woods porn stories at least at some point you know they're not without their controversies in 2015 one of the owners that john called an all-hands meeting to announce he was dating his assistant. And, of course, when the pair broke up, it caused problems. Former employee explains there were no boundaries between work and life. It was all just one big party all the time. For me, personally, I was single in 25. I didn't know any better. I thought it was a great place to work. I slowly realized how toxic it was. Once on an email chain asking employees to, quote, define douchebag, presumably for editorial purposes, the assistant sent a reply all that read, an unappreciative narcissistic man-child that craves attention and demands praise. John then responded with his own definition, a silly blonde who is secretly a brunette and dyes her hair every two weeks, check the roots, and is secretly addicted to painkillers and crystal meth. <laughs> So, you know, wow. not great. Again, it's one of those things where, like, it's a toxic workplace, even though you might not realize it, even though you might be the target demographic. You probably don't want to work there because of the whole sexual harassment part. Yeah, but... I, uh, when I was looking for work recently, I interviewed with a place that was, like, doing, like, freight brokerage, like a third party. Mm -hmm. And, uh, they like, had a really odd frat boy culture like very like wolf of wall street yeah for like not even i think 12 dudes in a mostly empty office in the basement of a building i never thought of in west county <laughs> like oh i've driven past this building before i didn't yeah. know there was actually anything in here yeah. um i actually took like the freight elevator down oh yeah because i was like noticing like there was like hooks like put up padding so like if you were moving furniture it wouldn't get banged up and i'm like the fuck how did i do this yeah but um I went on Indeed and checked their uh, like reviews, and there were so many like one and two star reviews from people like I came here for a serious job. Everyone just wants to get fucked up and be bros. And I'm like, oh, I would be the <laughs> sober guy that thrived in this environment. Everyone's getting fucking trashed. Like I can be the the one eyed man, yeah, in the land of the blind. Exactly right. I can be King Walrus. So I thought, I thought I had run into the Chive content recently, and I was right. In the local bar down the street. Oh, yeah. They have something called Chive TV, which is one of the Resig Brothers' other business ideas. And they take viral videos with attribution, I will say. They do, you know, show you the, the user who published these videos online. And they run it in an endless stream that you can put up on your bar's television and, and yeah, right down the street here and in many other places around the city and here in St. Louis atmosphere TV is the streaming that uh, they have things that are like specifically vibes based. So there's one that's like stupid human tricks called superhuman, or there's one where it's just like all pets called uh, pause. There's a news one. There's happy TV, which is all this positive content uh, chive TV, which is just basically all the different viral videos there. There's a trivia. There's an atmosphere trivia. I did play atmosphere trivia without realizing it was a chive thing. It, it's like puzzles, riddles, things like that. But I feel like I have encountered chive TV like when traveling and just being at like somewhere to get lunch. I'm like, dude, I just we just need to get like something to eat. Here, <laughs> this place doesn't have terrible reviews on right. Yelp or whatever. I just came for and a sandwich. Couple, yeah, and 
is the official TV channel of the bar that has a very okay but reasonably priced Caesar chicken wrap. Yeah, pretty much. That's where you'll see it. If videos, you, videos of guys like, oh, are they going to fall? And and you know, they got like the three sixty camera. Like, oh yeah, guys competitively racing uh, drones and shit. And oh yeah, yeah, chive on, brother, man. What I call stupid human tricks after the, the, human, the yeah, Letterman bit. Yeah. yeah, because I mean it's like trick shots, and then there's guys you know doing extreme stunts, and like yeah, it's, guys and like oh they're they're hopping through like an abandoned water park, and you're yeah, like, there's well, like drone footage. It's like slowed down. Uh huh. Oh yeah, just so you'll see it if you go. <laughs> basically, yeah. if you go drive to, on, you yeah. Know, fucking uh, did they start staking a blowjob day, or was that something else? I think staking a blowjob Reddit. day feels like something spiritually connected. I think that was Reddit though. Several websites, Wikipedia says, claim to the to be the official site, but none of them identify as the creator. The sites concur that the holiday was devised by radio DJ Tom Birdsey in 2002 during a show on WFNX radio station in Boston, Massachusetts. So uh, no site is actually the official one of those. According to uh, Lois Banner, the day apparently was a backlash against feminism. It feels very space moose. (laughs) Yeah. Men's health was unsure whether the holiday was actually celebrated or whether it was a joke. There was also a backlash to that called Cake and Cunnilingus Day. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> created by a web designer. So, yeah, um, just, just very stupid. Um, Whoa, world. Apricots and analingus? I don't know. What's the next step there? Apples and anal? There you go. Speaking of anal, um, it's uh, shock.jpg hairs time. Hairs and prolapses. <laughs> Speaking of prolapses, it's shock.jpg time. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. Shock.jpg. Oh, baby. Oh baby, what what fucking mockery of the human condition do you have for us today, Jason? I have here today something called Merry Christmas or Merry Holidays. Excuse me, Merry Holidays, Merry Holidays. Merry holidays. It, it was originally known as Merry Fucking Christmas. Uh, it's also been called Happy Holidays. It's had a few names. It lived a lot of lives. It was on Lol Shock. It was on Best Shockers. It had its own website, but it all originates here, according to the Screamer Wiki, from a. 52-minute pornographic video, Slaves No Mercy Bachelorette Special by Irene Boss. But it was condensed into the version we see here. So it is a uh, man spanking his own ass with the Santa hat and beard on. (laughs) Oh, that's really going in there. Mm -hmm. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no, not a sparkler. (laughs) Ah. And it just cuts off uh, right there. So yeah, it's um, yeah. So that, is, uh, that was a tour of the force. So Irene Boss, uh, seen performing any number of sexual depravities upon himself, uh, including uh, sticking firecrackers in his ass, having sex with a pumpkin, inflatable dolls. Let's see here, inserting a banana up his ass and then eating it. Yeah, that was upsetting. Pulling a rainbow lollipop out of his ass. Uh, doing an enema, making out with a blow-up doll, penetrating a raw turkey, and then supposedly eating his own uh, uh, cum out of it. Uh, same thing with a pumpkin. Just a tour de force. Better than Furiosa. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't that bad. And, uh, <laughs> did you finally watch it? I did. I did. Okay. We'll get. We'll get to that. Yeah. yeah. Merry holidays. I think was probably yeah. Because it it doesn't. It's not just Christmas. No. It's. Uh... We got Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving and you got, got the Easter uh, in there. I think Valentine's Day, maybe. Valentine's Day was in Halloween. there. Halloween. Halloween, yeah, with the pumpkins. Yeah, well, I guess Thanksgiving, both Halloween. Both of them. Yeah. Uh, my personal favorite was the, when he made the blow up doll sheep fuck the blow up doll guy. It's yeah. Like, that was what creative. are you getting out of this? And there's also a couple of scenes where it's obviously a second person. Yeah. Which, uh, that's a choice. You got to wonder. Like, okay. Somebody's filming it, but I always thought it was just a tripod, you know. But, yeah, but there's like a zoom. There's some zoom going on there, and there's I, there's also like a brief scene where it looks like a woman is beating his ass pretty hard with something. Yeah, yeah, that was depraved. <sighs> yeah, thanks for enriching my life. <laughs> That's what we aim to do. Yeah, I really, really appreciate, really appreciate this. Originally, it was just fucking Xmas was the was the, the website there. It got picked up by a few other places, but yeah. I like the uh, first comment here on the Screamer Wiki. 
by the user <laughs> I has ears from the 19 months ago. Yeah, about a year and some change. Yeah. yeah, I still wonder, and even after trying to find it, if the 60 minute version is real. Yeah, you do have to wonder because I mean, I think it would be much easier to do a bunch of small clips out of context than it would be to cut down a 52 minute video. That was gross. Thanks, mm. dude. And it wasn't gross because he was expressing himself sexually what he was doing to express himself sexually was upsetting it was the doo-doo it's mostly the doo-doo mostly the doo-doo mostly the <laughs> thankfully thankfully it's like a 340p file thank god yeah so there's really there's lots just like up to your imagination yeah like, is that a do oh yeah that is a duke you know you kind of get that yeah, it doesn't, well, it, you know it's a, it's so abstracted because of the resolution and, thank and, god and, it's one of those things where you're like okay well you know what at least it's not worse it yeah. could be worse it could be so much worse it could be a you know a 4K you know <laughs> HDR 10 just fully you know oh you can see the different shades of brown in the dookie you know I feel like I should get prospector mm. an opinion on this maybe I think maybe this is like the 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 cultural mythology by like gooners really coveting like their 360 and like 480p like old <laughs> like files maybe there's a sense of abstraction but like. Not that I go out looking for it. Right. But I feel like there is a lot less stuff like what you just showed me in like 1080p and 4K. Like I just don't think that's there. I think there's some anonymity that's pro- that was provided by the, the primitive audio and visual quality of these early like shock videos and shock images and things like that. Well, I also think that a lot of what you're going to find when you're looking for something specific like this is something that's really shot by amateurs, right? So it's not going to be on really high quality formats even now. You know, it'll be shot on like a cell phone camera right. or something like that. And, so. st- and still, it's, it, it, it ends up looking unreal, like that video of the donkey getting hit by the fucking train in Bangladesh, <laughs> where it, like it's. It, you've, you've I've seen, seen this. It, right? Yeah, yeah, I've seen yeah, this. I, I love how it just like. Like just explodes like it's a PS One yeah. model. Like yeah. it still doesn't feel real, even though like that's a it is a relatively high quality image. Mm-hmm. That donkey still blows up like it's a fucking Crash Bandicoot enemy. Yeah, like it's in Gary's mod or something. Yeah, yeah, it's like very it's odd. Just, like, it, like which makes you wonder. Like I guess life is this absurd. <laughs> I think it is. It's time for your mom's favorite part of the show. It's time for the breath mint. Uh, all right. Well, after that, I think it's time for a breath mint. Brian, fascinating thing this week is that at least two of our breath mints are shared experiences. Gosh, yeah. You and I went on a little bro date. That's what my wife called it, which, you know, it's fine. It's just like you didn't, you know, didn't bother to kiss me afterwards. So I felt kind of weird about it. It's just, but um, I'm moving too fast. I know. I know. Yeah, it's just, it's fine. Sell down there. Smartly. I know. I know. I'm sorry. But but went to see. If it'll happen. It'll happen. I know. I know. You can't force it. And we went to see Long Legs, the horror movie that everybody's talking about, except it's not a horror movie. It's a suspense film. It is. It's a thriller. It's a thriller. I enjoyed it quite a bit. So did I. Upon reflection, when I walked out of the theater, I think I kind of intimated to you that like Man, I was a little disappointed. But I think that is down to the marketing. Because every piece of marketing I've seen was billing it as you're going to shit your pants and your ancestors are going to, you know, look down upon you with shame for seeing such a horrible horror movie. Yeah, I saw some of that, too. I I really didn't know anything about the movie going in. But, of course, the algorithm, after having seen it and like <laughs> talked about it, um, started serving me ads for it, like on YouTube and other platforms. Right. And was kind of like, wow, yeah, no, the... Uh, Online ads aren't really selling the movie for what it is. And no. I think that's uh, going to buy it in the ass at some point. Yeah, because word of mouth right now is still getting around that, like, yeah, it's good, but it's not a horror movie. And hopefully that'll kind of make the rounds. Because I'm on Letterboxd. I'm on Letterboxd all the time. And, and yeah, are you uh, following Will Meneker? Of course. Movie Mindset. You got to have it. You, you got to <laughs> have it. Following him, um, Demi Ogaribe and uh, Matt Lachansky and a couple other like people that we, we kind of... And there's even a, a joke account on Letterboxd called uh, Drill Reviews 
where it takes a recent drill tweet and applies it to a recent movie. That's pretty good. It's perfect. The one for Long Legs was, uh, why is everyone filming and nobody helping him? <laughs> <laughs> which, is, which is great. Uh, so Long Legs, Brian, for, for those of you in the audience who may or not have seen it, we'll try to avoid spoilers as much as you can. We'll tag them if they do come up. But Long Legs is a, it's got a pedigree, right? It's got this, Silence of the Lambs type deal where it's a young FBI agent. She's on assignment. She was intuitive in this one case that they show you. And so they said, well, maybe she's going to be intuitive enough to kind of pick up what's going on with this long legs case that we've had for forever since the 70s. And it's creepy and it's got this seven vibe where there's these crime scenes yeah, that are unusual. Say, it feels a little bit like Silence of the Lambs, a little bit like seven, a little bit hereditary. Yeah, I got that from some of the some of the devil stuff that they kept creeping in there. Um, but yeah, it um, there's I, visual motifs, the triangles and whatnot. So yeah, they're they're all over the movie. I think it was also like a. It's set in the '90s. Mm-hmm. One of the things I really appreciate about the aesthetic and the set dressing of that movie is that so much shit, even though it's in the '90s is still like stuck in the 60s and 70s. Yes. Which is how I distinctly remember growing up in the neighborhood that I grew up in in Spanish Lake, which is like yeah, like people like there's people that have like, you know, computers and shit. Like I had neighbors with computers even when that was a fucking fancy ass thing. <laughs> but you like, had your gateway that you got from uh, you know, yeah, from or, or, or com, you know, something from CompUSA or whatever. Right. But like your grandpa was, you know, your buddy, your friends, or the kid down the street, his grandpa might still be driving like the fucking late seventies Celica, yes, or something like, or everything's old. You go into mm-hmm. the basement of someone's house, or even the house you're living in, like my grandparents' house, like all kinds of weird old shit. Like mm-hmm. I have like in my mom's basement, like a whole entire like giant box of like old toys that were like my mom and her sister's toys, like original, like 1960s, like cooties and stuff like that. Right. So I really felt like that was a good slice mm-hmm. of, of where this place was. Uh, Cause I still distinctly remember that being the case until probably like the early two thousands. It's like you could go somewhere and aside from a few, maybe comforts, like this shit hasn't really changed in the last 30 years. Yeah. I had that same feeling of like going back and catching an X-Files episode. Sure. But yes, growing up in that time period, it, it definitely rings true. A lot of the, the trappings. Cause like, yeah, a lot, and it takes place in the Pacific Northwest because all good creepy stories have to. Sure. And the, the cars were right. The, the clothing was right. Like there's a lot of details that they get. So right. And this is uh, Oz Perkins, son of Anthony Perkins, uh, which I always yeah. love as a, as a nice little factoid. But you can definitely tell that Oz Perkins studied his Hitchcock because shots will linger, right? And, and things will build tension in ways that modern movies don't always do unless they're Ari Aster. You know what I mean? Like there's maybe yeah. a few techniques that are much older, it kind of like, yeah, I, I was raised by a guy who was in these types of movies and I got it, you know, I got the bug and I kind of got into this concept and you can show it's, it's, it's all up there on the screen, even though it's set in the nineties, right? The music is by T-Rex. <laughs> you love that detail. All the licensed music. Yeah. All the licensed music. Yeah, you're right. The, the non diegetic music is very creepy and very modern, but in a way that kind of feels like it would have belonged Right, it doesn't you know? feel out of place. It doesn't feel like this is uh There's no friction. There's a great moment in the opening. There's a brilliant little opening scene, and then it, it starts looking almost like it was shot on Super 8. And then as the credits go, the... the um, Aspect ratio widens. Thank you. It's like a 16 by 9 or whatever. It's so slow. It's just it's, it's bringing you into the movie. It's br- washing over you, this experience of the film. And... I appreciate that little detail. That was kind of neat. I always love to see an aspect change happen in a movie, and I like to see how they happen. Yeah, it just a lots lots of little bits of creativity. A lot. It's a small cast, mm-hmm. and everyone's performance pretty much nails it. I feel like, as far as characterization or what they have to do, I I feel like the mother might be the weakest part. She's barely in it. Trying to get into spoiler territory. I but know some of the motivations become apparent near the end. 
I yeah. are a little they're a little flimsy. You could give us more. Yeah, the I movie. feel like that there's a couple plot points near the, the back third of the movie that uh could have used a little bit more world building or a little even just more dialogue. I think that was a major issue for me too because I the way the movie sets itself up is that it's going to be a serial killer thriller, right? Mm-hmm. It takes a left turn and it introduces some supernatural stuff. And I think that's where my disconnect hit. I was all in when it was just Silence of the Lambs or when it was just Seven, but then it hits like the supernatural skid and I go, oh. <laughs> yeah. And I think, I think, like you said, if it had been handled with a little, a little bit more of a even hand. So I saw the twist coming pretty far, far ahead. Okay. Like I felt like I figured out the twist really early on, but what I kind of got out of it was like the movie kind of, I think it fumbles the twist. Yes. It's not the most elegant way it could have been presented, but why we'll give them is that when it kind of like, yeah, this is a twist. We didn't do that, but here it's actually more fucked up than you thought. That is true. Yeah. At least it gave us, it didn't insult us in that respect. It was like, Oh yeah, no, we, we uh no it's way weirder and i told you this after the after the movie that the thing one of the things i really respected about it was that it was a modern horror horror film that actually stuck the fucking landing for sure came to the ending yeah it, it, you're committing to the bit and we're going to see this through and you certainly did the thing i will give them that that is absolutely true because once the twist hits and once you're like okay we're turning into the skid we're committing to the bit it hits no question The more I've thought about it, the more it's just kind of this unsettling, this vibes-based movie. And we haven't even talked about Nicolas Cage yet, but Nicolas Cage. Fuck me. I thought Mandy was going to be his best in the recent years. But I think this, to me, hits in a way that Mandy didn't. What did you think of Nicolas Cage in in Long Um, Nights? So I'm going to be really honest. Mm. I would rather have had... He had a kid with uh, Uma Thurman. Ethan Hawke. Ethan Hawke. Well, you saw the Black Phone then. Yeah, I would, I would, I would. I think Ethan Hawke would kill that role. I think uh, it's a little bit of stunt casting. I think Ethan Hawke would have been a little bit of stunt casting if, if, because he'd just come off of the Black Phone. Sure, but the, I think um, the Black Phone shows show that Ethan Hawke still has some some shit to, to prove. Yeah, yeah, for sure. He's still got a little bit of gas in the tank. That is the first time I've been excited about seeing Ethan Hawke in a movie. <laughs> I don't know since the nineties. Yeah, I can pretty but safely say that myself. Yeah, I, for sure. I, I, Nicholas Cage does a fine job. I, they don't build up the serial killer enough, I feel. Yeah, because a lot of the movie really does focus on Lee Harkins, the the, char- the main character of the film. and He's not enough of a presence as far as like a, 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 a force, because so much of, of what the plot is dealing with is things that happened in the past. Right. And so it's all past tense yeah the only times you really see him in the present are interacting with like store clerks <laughs> yeah and some of that stuff's good um when cage is given some time to chew the scenery and really just be a fucking weirdo i mean it's great i oh. just I, I just wish there was more to chew on with that character yeah, more screen time maybe another scene or two where you get more of that backstory that was kind of rushed a little bit maybe but as i told you um as the credits were rolling, is like this is an accurate representation of every adult I ever met that likes that's really in the T. Really the T Rex. Well, and I think the gag really is supposed to be that 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 the Nicolas Cage character looks like Mark Bolin. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's what he's the, got a fucking flying V. Oh yeah, yeah, Nixon. big big yeah. fan. Uh, yeah, there's just there's so many little details to get lost in. I think it's a definitely see it. It's not one of those things where I'd say, oh, well, don't don't bother. No, I would definitely say... It's definitely see, worth watching. I, see I, it. Uh, just temper your expectations. You're not going to shit your pants because it's so scary. But, but you, you will might get enjoy creep- it the same way you enjoy a movie like Seven or um, Silence of the Lambs. Yeah, you can get creeped out at, at certain points. There'll be a little bit of the skin crawling, which is really, for a thriller like this, what you really want. Absolutely. The other movie that we both saw... Separately. Separately. Furiosa, a Mad Max story. Brian, what did you think of Furiosa, a Mad Max story? 
a movie that is both a masterpiece and has no reason to exist. Thank you. Yes, I think it was too long by an hour. <laughs> yeah, it's like a two-hour and 20-minute movie. It's two and a half uh, and then some, and it just... It's too long on the tooth. I really liked whichever Hemsworth brother that was. Was it Chris? Chris yeah. Hemsworth. Chris Hemsworth as uh, Dementis. Doing like a fucking the butler, his best impression of the butler from Clue. <laughs> the Tim Curry, but yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, if the, I told you, I was really crazy. With the uh, very obvious fake nose. Like, what the fuck was that about? Yeah. But you had a, a recurring cast, some of the great villains from Fury Road making their comeback, a Morton Joe, get the Rictus so, and Scrotus. Here's the thing. They didn't get the actor back for Morton Joe, and they didn't get the original actor back for uh, the gun guy, the uh, bu- uh, bullet farmer The guy. bullet farmer, yeah. Yeah, which I think the bullet farmer is less of a loss because I think the guy that they got did a pretty good characterization followed the characterization from the original movie hmm. but the individual they got to play a morton joe in this movie just does not have the presence but i didn't notice oh i noticed immediately i'm like is this guy got is he like sick <laughs> like i had like i actually like stopped and like looked it up on wikipedia and i'm like oh no they got a different guy because the guy they had in the in, in uh fury road is the same guy that played toe cutter in the yeah. original i remember and um yeah, he just doesn't have the screen presence or the vibe. And I was like, ah, uh, because I felt like Morton Joe should be like imposing and terrifying. And he kind of was just acting like a guy that's waiting for the pizza guy to leave so he can close the door. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, that, that is. It kinda, that it's kind of like that. he's just like, okay, you're done. Like, like it's, it's really okay, my like line. he's just waiting for other people to be done with their bullshit so he can go back to his stories. Mm-hmm. I think that is. One of the biggest losses of the film. I think all of the action scenes are pretty fucking top notch. Yeah. You'll find no complaints amongst them. Maybe a few little titchy little CGI hitches here and there where it's kind of like, uh, eh, this it maybe needs another pass. Maybe we needed a, another shot of this to maybe help the VFX guys out. Was, um, this, was this your best take? <laughs> you do wonder sometimes in some of these shots, like, could we maybe do another one of these? Can we get another pass at this? But overall, the effect is, it's a very long movie. It's a very long movie. It's subdivided into five chapters, and I really feel like the first two could have been flashbacks interspersed through this story at certain moments. That's, again, that it's just me. I feel like, as a whole, is a pointless prequel to a movie that was damn near perfect. <laughs> <laughs> like yeah. story wise, you know the the, the st- like you said, it didn't need to exist. Uh, I did not need to know where Furiosa came from, how she lost her arm, what the green place was. None of that was important to me when watching Fury Road. But apparently, to someone, they wanted to know all these details. It's largely unimportant. Yeah, and, and even though it is largely, there's still like cool shit that happens. There's yeah, it's still cool. Cool ideas, and there's cool sequences, and just some of the stuff like the plotting, like the the how you actually like execute, like the do the storyboarding. Yeah, had to be intense, like and how how you do this correctly, and there's a really great rhythm and like uh, nonverbal language to this film. That when it's hitting hard, it's 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 enthralling. It's hard to to look away from the screen to be have your attention be divided elsewhere. Uh, but there's also a lot of moments where I'm like, I th- I think this is supposed to be poignant, but I don't give a shit. Yeah, I'm not getting it. You yeah. know, could have cut this. There's a there's a death scene of a particular character that doesn't get like a good end cap. I'm like, oh wow, like. Well, and they also don't really do a good job building the relationship between Jack and Furiosa. No, because it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to train you. And then it cuts to, okay, now you're trained. Like, no, yeah. come on. Get, <laughs> give me something here. Yeah, uh, yeah, you can. Yeah, that's pretty much working at Domino's. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the Furiosa of this pizza oven. Yeah. yeah it's just, uh, it's, there's just so much. Uh, yeah, it is weird that it doesn't build that up, but also feels like it has to spend... 45 minutes getting to the part like how does 
Dementis get Furiosa. Yeah. I, I feel like there's so much stuff that doesn't need to be in there. I hate to be that guy, but you really, you could use an editor. That's Well, I think the editor was his wife. Sometimes that works. George Lucas, the editor, was his wife. That worked out. This, not well, so much. Uh, well, he used his wife on Fury Road, and I I don't know. I, I, it's, it's a very a, different movie, I guess. It's yeah. such a baffling film. Like, there was so many times watching it where I'm like, is this it? <laughs> like, this is cool, and there's so many moments there. There's so many so stuff with Dementis that's really fun. Yeah. And how he changes as a character. Outside of Furiosa is, like, the only character that actually has an arc. Yeah, the two of them are really the, the centerpiece. Of the movie, because everyone else is expendable. All the war boys, you know. Right. And and there's also, like, fun stuff, like, how, how did Immortan Joe get the, you know, the organic mechanic? And there's... Yeah, there's, there's fun, I mean, there's that's fine. fun things like that. And just, like, the way they express, like, everything's, like, evolved around this weird apocalyptic car culture that I always find interesting. And, like, how these are, like, these are, like, the, the chariots of the gods and, you know, all, uh, you know... Yeah, going into the, the the worshiping of the cars, and I think they actually included some stuff from the game that was interesting. Because yeah, uh, Scrotus, Scrotus is in Scrotus it. Scrotus is in the game, and they refer to they, people as black thumbs, and they have the car from the game. They have Chum Bucket. Chum Bucket, that's right. And even some of the 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 weapons of the firing the harpoons, and like there's some stuff from the game. Yeah, it's it's um like it's a very fun movie, and and I I appreciate the craft. It's an intricately crafted movie. The only moment of pathos of like anything like really emotional that hits is, and this is a spoiler, so skip ahead a minute or two if you don't want to hear it, which is when Dementis has been thwarted yeah. by Furiosa, and he's basically telling her, like, he is being a very honest character in this. Yeah, you're going to have to kill me, because there's you, no other... But, but you have to, like, if you kill me, this isn't going to bring back what you want. This is not going to solve anything. And no matter what you do to me, nothing is going to be better. If you're really talking about writing for a villain, that's devastating. <laughs> yeah, and like that that is probably one of the best scenes of the whole movie. And pretty much everything with Dementis is, is fun. Yeah, I enjoyed uh, Hemsworth in this much more than I've in a while, really. And, and also because he goes from being, you know, Dr. Dementis to then... <laughs> The, the red Dementis? And then the dark Dementis, yes. Yeah. <laughs> he changes he's, he's titles. Fucking, he's punished Venom Snake. <laughs> but uh, I, I love the bit about the teddy bear. That's a fun little detail because uh, the teddy bear loses its arm right when Furiosa loses hers. Yeah. There's some interesting little visual motifs that keep coming up that they repeated from Fury Road. Um, there's a lot of nice little bits of foreshadowing for Fury Road, which is nice. They even have an unused scene from Fury Road at the very end with Charlize Theron yeah. as she turns away from the camera. So it's a, it's got a very direct line. And I wonder if I watched Furiosa again and then watched Fury Road, would I appreciate the former more? Maybe, maybe they're intended to be of a piece, but I don't know. It's, it's really hard because there's that bit at the end where you're seeing scenes from Fury Road. In the credits. Yeah, in this new context. And it's like, okay, this is very clearly one came first. and the other. I don't know. It, it, it's, it's very confusing. I hate to say it, I see why it's a bomb. Yeah, I certainly understand it's that a, too. It's a really... Ambitious, for sure. Ambitious. You love to see ambition. Really, again, and I, and I think Dementis as a villain is really interesting because it's... You see in between a lot of the things he says and does, that it's like, he comes off like he's a crazy character. Right. But this is all really just about survival. Like, it doesn't really go any further than that. And I think the statement in there is that in an unreasonable world, reasonable men become unreasonable, which is, you know, some chive on, bro. Um, but yeah, like, but it's been a through line from the Mad Max films from the beginning. Sure. So it's it's kind of a, a wrapping up. It's like, yeah, this is the central thesis of all these movies that you've already seen. Or at least hopefully you've is already it, seen. Is that survival makes us all, can definitely rob us of our humanity and our reason. And, and Morton Joe, that's all about like power. Yes. And, but with Dementis, it's all just living. Like to be alive is the joy. Right. Is for 
uh, Morton Joe, it's all about having domination over other people, having the control of the flow of of Not resources. Food, yeah, yeah. It, the place of abundance. I felt like we spent too much time in Furiosa's past and not enough time with Furiosa as the character we know. I know that's weird to say about a prequel, but I I feel like the reason we like Furiosa as a character is because despite all this, she's still decent, right? And is still trying to do something good in this awful world. Which is kind of like what Mad Max was supposed to be like in the first couple movies. It was like someone trying to not be shitty. And I don't think we needed to see her suffer for an hour and a half before <laughs> right. before we got to that. But maybe, I mean, again, I'm not George Miller. I don't know, you know, his whole deal. But I, I feel like we could have trimmed no pay this. Big, it's no babe pig in the city. Oh, granted. I mean, come on. Other than that, Brian. <laughs> other than that, what you been up to this week? What uh, you got I, going? I beat Elden Ring. The uh, shadows there, tree or no, just I, I'm not, I, it's going to be like two years. Oh, okay. I that boss. So you beat the main game. I beat. The, I finally beat the Elden Beast, which is probably one of my least favorite final bosses in any video game I've ever played. Not great. However, because of this new update, you can use torrent during that fight. Yeah. For two years, you could not. I, I did it in the most noble way, which was I just did fucking Bloodhound Fang skill spam. <laughs> Mimic tier Bloodhound Fang. Yeah. GG easy. Yeah. But you know what? At that point, you beat Radagon. So. I beat Radagon. I, I beat Melina. Mel- Melina. Oh, nice. Well, that's how I remember when we were first talking about this. Like, I like how I said that I was I had beat the game was I had beat her. Yes. I was like, you know what? I beat the technically the hardest good boss in the game instead of, like, the one that feels like they... they people complain about the bosses in Shadows of the Earth Tree being, like, overtuned and all that. Elden Beast is undertuned. Mm-hmm. Like it, it feels clunky. It's there's no good rhythm to it. You got to run all over the place. It's it's the same thing with a lot of the dragon bosses. You're running. Dragon bosses can be fun at least. Yeah, dragon but this bosses is at just least can get like get you like fucking your blood pump. Fuck, fuck, fuck. After a while, you get so good at beating Radagon, they're like, oh shit, yeah, okay, I got to switch modes and go over to the. Yeah, you know, it's 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 frustrating. I don't like the one-two boss combos. I never did. I didn't like it in Bloodborne. I sure as shit didn't like it in Elden Ring. But you get through it because the rest of the game is so goddamn good. That's the thing. At least the other one-two bosses in the base game are fun. True. Even if they're kind of a little bullshitty. Uh, like with Godfrey. I'm trying to think who else. But, uh, well, Godfrey is just Godfrey and then wrestler Godfrey, right? Isn't that yeah, the... Okay. It's Hulkamania Godfrey. <laughs> yeah, brother! <laughs> Golden mm. Order is going to come down on you. Golden <laughs> Order is going to come down on you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yes, yeah, the horn scent. <laughs> he tears the he <laughs> tears the lion off him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, tarnished without grace. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you're right. Yeah, it's it's that. It's definitely you're changing gears between Godfrey and WrestleMania Godfrey. Yeah, it's. Uh, I enjoyed the base game, and I've, I've and also going back to Shadows of Earth Tree a little bit. Like, still think it does a very bad job of pointing you where to go that isn't the main story. Yeah, because I got through the, the the main story stuff rather quick. I got to the final boss rather fast. I had to actually sit down. I had to say I had to sit down with a guide to find all the other biomes to go to, and I've had quite a bit of fun. The first two places I went to, I was at that point rather over leveled, even though it still had some bosses giving me a hard time. Yeah, uh, but there are some design issues with Erdtree as far as like exploration. It doesn't feel as generous as the base game. But that being said, it's still a lot of fun. It's finding cool, weird items, interesting pieces of armor. Like, the exploration is good. You get little bits of lore that are sometimes really fun. I think I'm going to uh, try and max out some stuff before I do New Game Plus, And we'll probably do new game plus the dlc when i get there i've really been good at having a cheese bleed build <laughs> i'm wondering if for new game plus i should try just 
I heard. I remember when the game came out, people were always like, "Oh, actually, like bleeds like the 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 noble cheese strategy because okay. magic was so overpowered." Mm-hmm. But I, I've heard that's gotten balanced over time. I've noticed that. Well, combat is your used to be. You lay that down. Rock sling. Yeah, any gravity magic really was was always OP. But boy, there was a time where you could hit the one where it increases your magic. You hit the wondrous physic one that gives you infinite FP. And then you hit Common Azure, and it's like, okay, that was like three buttons, and I've won every boss battle. So, yeah, yeah Magic was for a long time OP. And Sorceries, even going back to, like, Dark Souls 2, are still OP because just it's there's ways to exploit that to make the game a lot easier. Yeah. So, yeah, enjoy. Have fun because, boy. Yeah, we'll see how that goes. I've, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's uh, a fun game. Money and time well spent. I don't know. I don't know if I have anything else, Jason. Um, yeah, I don't really either. I mean, like a dragon, infinite money again. Uh, continuing on from that, infinite wealth. Thank you. I keep saying infinite money. I don't know why I keep saying it. Greedy. Yeah, but I've been playing like a dragon, infinite wealth, and it's. I mean, I'm. It's slow going because I keep getting stuck on the whole fake Pokemon game <laughs> that they built in this, and I'm like, I've got two of the gym bosses down now. I'm. I'm, I'm at the uh, a bronze level. Of the Sujimon battles, <laughs> it's that, and and going back through Dongan Rampa, which I talked about last week. So yeah. yeah, not not really much else going on. That and Justified, but again, uh, that's a solid show. So I think that means it's, it's time, to, it's tell time to tell people where to find us online. If you want to find me online, uh, I am uh, Ishaki D Board on I S H O T G U I D B O R D. That's over on Twitter mostly. If you want to find me on other social media platforms, I'm at a music photographer. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. If you want to check out um, my photography portfolio, it's assholemusicphotographer.com. If you want to check out some photos and words, that's over on a, a. musicphotographer.com. If you want to check out the last only good media website left in St. Louis, go over to the artsstl.com. I, last week I mentioned that Laura Jurel uh, got some really great photos of X on their yes. farewell tour over at Delmar Hall. Uh, that stuff's up. She has a nice little write-up as well. She also did uh, got some really great photos of OK Go at the pageant Ooh. this past weekend, uh, making me a little jealous. I wanted to photograph I was gonna that. Say, but they're, they're real fun. I've photographed OK Go a few times. They are both a really great band live, and they're also a lot nicer to photographers and press than some other bands. Yeah, I wish they were just a little less cringy about their commercials. Yeah. Not, <laughs> commercials, their music videos. It's the same thing, brother. Come on. <laughs> Let's yeah. be honest with ourselves. But they're, they're a good live band, considering, like, not to get off on too much of a tangent, but I just remember when they were a band that had that music video that was the song, like, what, Get Over It or whatever, and get, people thought they were, like, a one-hit wonder, like mm-hmm. the Secret Machines or something. Yeah. And then it's like, oh, no, they're kind of still one of the biggest indie rock bands in the world, which is kind of wild, but... Anyways, uh, she's got some great photos that over there. My GZ photos should be up by the time this comes out. Kind of just had a lot of stuff coming up. So getting my little write-up done and my edits done took a minute. And uh, uh, we're recording this on a different night than we normally do because uh, tomorrow night I am, I believe, helping out the band Camino with some social media and video photo stuff. Yay. So, hey, who doesn't love paid work? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. When you're as fucking broke as I am. <laughs> I shouldn't laugh, but yeah. What, what you got for us, j Dog? So you can find me on the internet anytime there's a guy named Video Crime. Well, just like Tom Jode, I'll be there. V-I-D-E-O-C-R-I-M-E. That's Twitter, Blue Sky, various other places. With the notable exceptions of Instagram and TikTok, there I am, Laser Goose CEO. That's Laser with an S, because I am not a Philistine. You can contact the show in a myriad of ways, but my personal favorite is the telephone, 314-246-9766. That's 314-AHOY-POO, if you like to spell with your telephone. You can shoot us an email, Jason at four eight minutes of dogs com or Brian with a Y at four eight minutes of dogs com. Send us whatever you got. Requests, comments, complaints, recipes for cake, whatever it is, you can send it to us there. Support the show, patreon.com slash four eight minutes of dogs. There we have our weekly post show hangout slash cut content show. Boy, episode fourteen uh, was uh, was a bit long. 
<laughs> Episode 14 ran a little long, and that's okay. You can hear it there if you're any one of the paid tier subscribers over there on the Patreon. And, of course, if we get the 10 members at the $10 level by the end of the year, we will release the 90-minute commentary track for the Japanese puke fetish video, Garo Monster Home Delivery. Come on, folks. Yeah. I'm that unlikable. <laughs> ten of you. Between the two of us, yeah. I mean, there's there's got to be enough. Ten individuals. I, you know, maybe I need to be posting that a little bit more actively on my social. In the meantime, you can also find me on a podcast called Submitted for the Approval of the Midnight Pals, where I play a fictionalized version of Stephen King. New season hitting around Halloween. Well, as we always say at this time, namaste, good luck, eat the knife, give mommy a good gut fucking 25th Amendment now. <laughs> and uh, watch out for snakes. <laughs> Look out for snakes. Watch out for snakes. <laughs>